Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. So today, uh, um, David has done the annotated editions of those four books back there, Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, Persuasion, and what am I forgetting? Emma. Emma. Uh, Northanger Abbey is coming out this fall, and I'm assuming Mansfield Park is in the works. Yeah, next, sometime next, <laughs> next year. So, um, you know, there's books come out about Jane Austen constantly. I mean, I, it's... You know, we get Publishers Weekly every week. There's always a Jane Austen book in there, either a memoir or a novel about a continuation of the book. There's all kinds of stuff. So this is the latest entry. It's called What Matters in Jane Austen, 20 Crucial Pub Puzzles Solved. Each chapter is a question. This has something to do with the novels by John Moen. So here's David Shepard to tell us about this book. All right. Thank you. Um, people here fine? Um, all right, just, uh, he mentioned the title already, just a couple of basic points of information about the book. Uh, it's pub first published in Britain in 2012, um, just published recently here. Um, as he mentioned, it's a series of 20 chapters, um, each of them starting with a question, give people an idea. Just the first four would be, how much does age matter? Do sisters sleep together? What do the characters call each other? How do Jane Austen's characters look? Um, it's 340 pages long, and the price, at least for the hardcover edition that's out currently, is $30. I suspect there will be a paperback edition since there has already been a paperback up here in Britain. Um, the author, John Mullen, is a professor of English at University College in London. Uh, he's taught Austin for many years, according to the blurb on the jacket. He also writes a book club column on fiction for the Guardian newspaper, the Guardian being one of the leading newspapers in Britain. Um, he's a specialist in 18th century literature, and he's written a number of other books on literature, some of them on literature generally, some more particularly on the 18th century. There are actually a couple other books in the UHLS system that where he edited um, other works of 18th century literature. Um, now, after that, I guess the main thing to start out with, I think, uh, is just to give an overall sense of the book. I know with a movie review, they often have at the top uh, whether, you know, how many stars it would be or something like that. Well, I think if you had zero to four stars for this book, I would definitely do four stars. Overall, I think this is a very good book. Uh, I'll mention a few quibbles I have here and there, but basically I think it's an excellent book. Uh, it's actually one of the handful of books on Jane Austen analyzing her and her novels that I would probably most recommend if somebody were asking me to do, to recommend something. Um, it was something that not only came up with a lot of insights that I had never come up with before, but also stimulated some of my own reflections and additional insights, which I think is a sign of an excellent book that it can get you to start thinking yourself. Um, some of the features, as I said, I think it's very insightful and comes up with a lot of ideas that I've not come across before, and I've read an innumerable number of books on Jane Austen. Um, at the same time, it is also very accurate. Sometimes books that come up with a lot of new ideas do so because they approach from a very, very eccentric perspective and then end up saying things also that are not quite right. This one, though, is very accurate and shows a real knowledge of the books. Um, Finally, it is written in a very lively and accessible style. Um, often humor involved. I um, mean, one can perhaps discern here the author's background as a writer of a column for newspapers. He has a good ability to speak in a way that's very easy to understand, that's easy to read, and that also says, makes his points succinctly. So as I say, you know, overall, I would highly recommend it. Um, at the same time, just a few caveats before I start discussing the substance of the book. Um, it is, first, it is, a real, it is a book for Austin aficionados. Um, and this is not a criticism. All books must 
appeal to a certain type of audience. No book can appeal to everyone of all different levels of knowledge and interest. But this is a book that I think is especially geared toward those who already know Jane Austen fairly well and are already very strongly interested in her. It would not be an ideal introduction to Jane Austen for someone who is less familiar. Um, it, uh, it assumes knowledge of the novels, and in fact, in many ways, fairly in-depth knowledge of the novels. He refers frequently to things that happen with the assumption that people will understand them, what he's referring to, not just even uh, that they will not simply understand the basic story, but also even some of the more subtle details of the story. And he discusses many more difficult or sometimes even arcane points in the novels to help illuminate things. Um, and while discussing some of these points, there are many basic elements that what might be useful for, the, for a beginning reader, such as Jane Austen's own personal biography, um, her reading and the background of previous novels, the social and historical background, what kind of society she lived in and what sort of society do the books take place in, um, you know, the history of the publication and the reception of the novels. All of these basic points are something that you'd expect an introduction. He doesn't address them directly, though he obviously is aware of them and occasionally will, you know, allude to them as he's making his points. So, um, for someone looking for an introduction, this wouldn't be ideal. For someone who already has read about Jane Austen and knows her well, I think it would be an excellent choice. Um, another feature of the book that, again, would depend on whether this would be a good point or a bad point, uh, would depend on the reader, it's not a book with one big overarching argument. It doesn't have one general thesis around which everything is organized. It is a series of 20 different <laughs> chapters, each of which are basically standalone. Um, makes it a little, in some ways, more difficult to review because you can't sort of focus just on one main argument. And I suppose if, for some readers who like a book with a big argument, this could be a handicap. On the other hand, it has the advantage of making the book very accessible, despite its length. I mean, it might be a little daunting. You look at, you know, 340 pages of fairly, in many cases, fairly dense argument, but it's a book that's very easy to begin because you don't, you, know, you can always read a chapter or two without committing yourself to the rest because each chapter is standalone and while they're in an order, that order isn't essential. If you just pick it up and decide you're especially interested in certain topics, you could go ahead and read those and see what you think and then decide whether to read others without suffering any because there isn't, the order is not critical. Um, and in many ways, that makes it suitable for Jane Austen herself because one of the features of her is that she is so extraordinarily good when it comes to the details. I mean, she has a general story, but often there isn't a lot of big dramatic events that happen in the course of, this, of the story. A lot of it is a record of day-to-day -day life, but she's so brilliant at bringing out all the details of that, of what people are thinking, what they're saying, of their actions. And so a book that really delves into the particular details, as this book does, and you know, notice is very subtle, um, hard to discern points, is in many ways very suited to Jane Austen because also one of the things about Jane Austen is she's, she is a very subtle writer and every time you read her you can discover new things that you hadn't noticed before because she t makes her point very quietly. Um, so the final thing I would say is that in some respects, and this may be a mild criticism, slight criticism, the title may be a little misleading. Um, what matters in Jane Austen is the main title. I would say it deals with much that matters in Jane Austen, but it doesn't deal at least directly with many things that matter a lot. It doesn't talk much directly about romance and about the whole process of heroine's development through romance. It doesn't talk a lot about, or at least directly address the issue of family relations. It doesn't directly address the issue of some of her moral themes. It doesn't directly focus on a lot of basic elements of social background, such as the gentry class that her characters belong to, or the role of women, or the code of daily conduct. Um, it doesn't talk about some of her main literary techniques, especially the use of dialogue. Um, it's not that the author is not aware of this, it's simply that these are basic topics that a lot of books have covered, and the author is focusing more on what has not been discussed as much before and what has not been noticed as much before. Um, so uh, um, similarly, you might say it 
the subtitle, 20 Crucial Puzzles Solved, it's not really, I would say, primarily a book, as there are some that, of puzzles in the sense of, you know, why did one specific thing happen, and a detailed exploration of that. He uses the format of having each chapter be, uh, be titled with a question just as a way of introducing things. It works fine, but it's not essential. He could just as easily have titled the chapters in a more straightforward way. There isn't a focus on specific mysteries or conundrums. I mean, a more accurate title what might be what matters in Jane Austen, but is often overlooked or hard to perceive. However, I can understand perhaps why they did this. I suspect that a title like that might not be quite as marketable as a title such as they've chosen. Um, but after the sort of those sort of brief caveats, go on to look at sort of the meat of the book. As I say, it's a series of, ch of chapters, 20 chapters, exploring all sorts of different issues. Um, in each one, I'd say the common theme is to find patterns that exist across the books. Each of the chapters deals with almost all of the books and shows how there are certain elements you can find in each of the books and drawing connections between them. It often, for example, will then use that to show some general rules about what life is like in the novels or what the novels are like. Um, and then in times, then in turn, to go on to show exceptions to these rules that are significant. One example would be he has a whole chapter on the, what characters call each other. And he discusses the conventions, usually very formal, about how, for example, husbands and wives almost never address each other by their first name. And people almost rarely even, who are unmarried, also rarely address each other by their first name. But there are occasional cases where people do, and that then becomes significant, knowing that there is this general rule when ca in cases where people, for example, people violate the rule and call each other by their first name, it sometimes is a sign of intimacy, sometimes it's a sign that that person doesn't have a good sense of etiquette or manners. Um, and also, I think, in addition to that, I would point to a general theme that is especially um, prominent in, in a number of chapters that I will discuss, a theme of detecting what is hidden, what is less obvious, what is implicit. And um, they say I might go on and just mention some examples of that. Uh, he has a number of chapters that you might, I might call literary chapters where he analyzes the techniques, the story, the way Jane Austen operates as a novelist. I think those are, frankly, especially good. I think all the chapters are good, but those are especially good, and that maybe uh, what one might expect given that he is a professor of English, where that is you know, what you mostly focus on. Um, I think especially, I think probably the standout chapter of the whole book for me was the very last one, which looks at Jane Austen's use of what he's sometimes called free indirect style or free indirect speech, where the author narrates something in, um, and uses language essentially to mimic the character's thoughts and moods. So it's a way of kind of the author entering the subjective consciousness of the character without actually switching directly to the first person. And it's a, something that she uses with great subtlety. She's probably the first author in English who developed this technique to a great degree. And it's still one of the best examples of it. And, it's, and he said it's quite remarkable that she um, was really a pioneer in this, that she, this technique that really nobody had developed before, she suddenly comes along and develops it to a great uh, degree with great sophistication. Um, and he, at the same time, other chapters, though, he focuses of these literary chapters on things that are more exceptions to the rule. And to mention three, first, he has one chapter called Which Important Characters Never Speak in the Novels? This is an interesting point because one of the things about Jane Austen's novels is they are full of dialogue. She relies on dialogue more than almost any other, sort of, uh, at least classic novelist, more than most novelists. One of the reasons is because she is especially superb in dialogue. Her ability to develop characters through their dialogue, through what they say, and the manner that they say it is so extraordinary. Um, so when you have, as as we have in a few cases, important characters who are never actually quoted, that itself becomes significant. And three that he looks at um, are one, there is the character of Robert Martin, who plays a critical role in the novel Emma. He, the novel begins in many ways with Emma, the heroine, persuading this other young woman, Harriet Smith, 
not to marry Robert Martin, even though she's in love with him. And that has great ramifications throughout the novel. And so, and Robert Martin continues to appear at various points, but he never says anything. He is never actually directly quoted. And in many ways, this itself is significant because what it shows is first, Emma's contempt for him. You know, she never bothers engaging him directly in conversation. And also the fact that in this novel, more than other novels of Jane Austen, looks at everything through the eyes of the heroine. So that because we are looking at the character through the eyes of someone who looks upon him with contempt, we never hear him directly. So that silence itself speaks something. Um, another character in Pride and Prejudice is Georgiana Darcy, um, the sister of the main male character. Um, and she comes along later, and Darcy's decision to introduce Elizabeth, the heroine, to her is a very important scene, a sign of his growing interest in Elizabeth. Um, but she never says anything. And it, it's a sign partly of her timidity and shyness. It also of her being recently traumatized by, a, uh, by her own bad experience with the, the novel's villain, Mr. Wickham. Uh, a third character, perhaps most striking in this, is the character of Captain Benwick, or Benwick, in Persuasion, plays a very critical role, the first unmarried male to pay serious attention to the heroine, um, and also one who later, whose engagement to another woman is the critical twist in the plot that paves the way for the final resolution. His speech is frequently described. There is discussion of how he talks a lot to Anne, the heroine, but he's never actually quoted. And in many ways, this, as Mullen explains, I think it's a good point that this indicates something about him. First, that his speech is very self-absorbed. He's always talking about his own trauma, and that to a great degree, it's also by rote. He's basically reciting poetry rather than really engaging in dialogue. Um, so again, he uses exceptions to the general rule to make, or he, he shows how Austin uses exceptions to her general rules to make certain important points. Uh, another one chapter is entitled, What Do Characters Say When the Heroine Is Not There? One of the things about Jane Austen's novels is the heroine is almost always at the center of everything. She's the lens through which we see the entire story. And she's in almost every scene, but there are occasional scenes where she's not present, and those themselves become significant. So in the case of Pride and Prejudice, there are a few scenes where Miss Bingley, who is sort of the rival to Elizabeth, the heroine, speaks to Mr. Darcy and tries to denigrate Elizabeth. These scenes early on, a couple scenes, um, serve to indicate first her jealousy and also give a sense to the reader, which um, we otherwise might not have such a sense of, that. Darcy must be actually interested in Elizabeth, because otherwise Miss Bingley wouldn't be bothering to make these denigrating comments. At the same time, because they're taking place outside of the heroine's hearing, it means that she isn't aware of this. And one of the things that happens is that she is not aware how much Darcy is becoming genuinely interested in her. Later, uh, Miss Bingley tries, uh, seen toward the end, to denigrate Elizabeth again, and this time Darcy disagrees open with her and says, I actually consider her to be a very handsome woman. Um, well, this again is a sign of Darcy is, is becoming more open in his uh, affection for Elizabeth and willing to acknowledge it. At the same time, the fact that Elizabeth doesn't hear it means that she remains in suspense about this during the latter course of the novel, and this adds to some of the tension and drama during the later part. Um, you have another case that mentions how Mansfield Park is, of all the novels, the one where the heroine is most absent. And this itself is partly a reflection of the heroine, her relatively retiring nature. It also plays a critical role because it means that two other one of the other characters, Henry Crawford, is frequently shown explaining to his sister his sort of uh, romantic intrigues, how he first, first how he plans to um, try to make uh, a cousin of the heroine fall in love with him, and then later how he plans to uh, go after the heroine herself. Um, we have another case in the, in the case of Emma, where she is v probably more than in most, really, in everything. But it, you do have a couple points where she's not present. And usually, these are scenes involving the main male character, Mr. Knightley. And these scenes allow him to indicate his interest in Emma 
and his suspicion of, and to a certain degree, jealousy of Frank Churchill, which is, and as the author makes a good point, that jealousy itself helps spark his ultimate interest in, or romantic interest in the heroine. Um, a final thing on these literary chapters, one is entitled, When Does Jane Austen Speak Directly to the Reader? Again, the basic practice of Jane Austen is to be a very impersonal author. She doesn't directly address the reader, mostly she just narrates the story and then you know, describes what's happening, but occasionally she steps out of that more impersonal role and makes a direct comment and often he shows how many of these are used to make a point. He also uh, points out how Northanger Abbey, um, her first, her earliest of her finished novels is one where she does it far more than any other. And that, it re that novel really stands out in that respect. Partly this may be a sign of youth. Um, her next novel, Sense and Sensibility, probably has more of these direct asides than any later ones. But it also, perhaps more significantly, it results both from the satirical purpose of the novel. Um, you know, she's trying to compare, she's attacking other novels. It also is a result of the naivete of the heroine, um, who because she's so naive, and innocent, um, she cannot understand as much on her own, therefore the author must in a sense separate herself more from the heroine in order to make points directly. Um, and especially because another thing he had pointed out in the chapter on um, when is the heroine absent, well Northanger Abbey is the one where the heroine is present more than any other, but because that heroine was naive, it means the author has to do more to make up for that by speaking directly to the reader. So anyway, these are, as I say, a common theme of looking at, you might say, the exceptions to the general rule. And I think you can also see the, the similar themes in many of the, what I would call maybe the historical or social chapters, which are more numerous, which are ones where he explains different features of the society of the novels or of how people lived. Um, you know, examples, you have a chapter on weather. Uh, and, and how that affects people. A chapter on the seaside, a chapter on the games people play, a chapter on money and its role and, and its value, a chapter on what people read. Um, and he, in each of these, he goes carefully through both the novels themselves, um, as well as uh, Jane Austen's letters that he has um, read very carefully uh, to uh, discern or to gather evidence to show many features of the basic society in order to have a sense of what kind of world they're operating in. Um, he also occasionally makes reference to other sources, and here I think I make one criticism, I think maybe a sign that perhaps he's more of a literary critic than a historian. For example, in um, he has a chapter about the age, about the issue of age, and he talks about how in the novels there's a great emphasis upon the characters marrying young, especially women, but all the characters tend to marry at a very young age and there's a lot of, there is a lot of pressure for them to do so. Um, but then he, he, and he's right about that, he then says, well, but if you look at statistics, and he quotes a historian, the average age of marriage in England at that time was about mid-twenties, and most of the people in the novels marry earlier, well maybe this is a sign that Jane Austen, this is a, liter, this is a convention of Jane Austen, she's just doing this because it serves her purpose in the novel. Well in fact he's right that statistically the average was around mid-twenties, but the reason was because poor people tended to marry fairly late in this society because they needed usually to wait until their twenties, often their mid-twenties, in order to be able to accumulate enough money to start a household. Wealthy people who didn't have that pressure um, tended to marry earlier, but because the majority of the population was poor, in when you look at statistical averages, poor people, they're the ones who determine it, and then you add on the fact that there are some people in all classes who marry late because of maybe spouses died, you end up having an average that's in the mid-20s, even though most of the characters in the wealthier milieus that Jane Austen portrays would marry significantly younger than that. So in any case, that, as I say, was Wolf's one mistake, that uh, small mistake that I noticed. But otherwise, I think, you know, in general, and there are a few other points I could quibble with, but generally, I think he has a very, very good analysis of these matters. And especially, again, looking at matters, I think at one, in a number of chapters, he focuses on things that were not, that were 
people were aware of then, but we have lost an awareness of. Certain basic features of life at that time that everyone knew about, and because everyone knew about, she doesn't spell out, but because things have changed since then, we often overlook it. Um, one of those would be the issue of death and illness. This, um, I mean, in a certain sense, it's gonna be a little deceptive because Jane Austen doesn't deal directly a lot with this. You know, she's a, a novelist who mostly has happy endings. She doesn't, not a lot, many characters die in her novels. She focuses mostly on young people who are naturally at less risk of death. Um, but, uh, and so it's easy to overlook the importance, but in fact, if you look more carefully, you can see that the constant reality and threat of death is still very much there. I mean, this is a society where life expectancy was low. Many people died young. Children especially often died, and even after people reached adulthood, people would often die very quickly and suddenly from all sorts of illnesses that couldn't even be diagnosed. Um, and there are various results that you can actually notice if you look carefully, and he points these out in the novels. One thing is that p people at various points are discussed as being in mourning dress. Well, in fact, in many of these novels, people probably spend a good part of the time actually in mourning dress because there were very strict conventions relating to that. Um, and, uh, but you know, we don't notice that, but that was something that people who were reading it at the time would have known so she didn't bother to do that. Also, we see another thing is that you have a lot of characters who, um, you have a lot of cases of widows and widowers. Many of the characters are missing one parent or sometimes even both parents. Again, this is something that was a, you know, you might say, well, maybe she's doing this as part of a convention because she wants to leave characters on their own to make decisions. Well, but in fact, that was a very common reality of life then. Um, you also have an awareness of the possibility that people might die and of the effects that would have. I mean, in Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Bennett is constantly complaining about the entail that it means that when her husband dies, the property is gonna to go to a cousin of theirs, Mr. Collins. Well, one thing that makes her comments especially um, poignant, one reason she is so obsessed with it is simply the very fact that Mr. Bennett could easily die any time, even though he's probably in his 40s or so, so not that old a man, and he, he doesn't discuss, there are no health problems discussed relating to him. Nonetheless, death is always present as a, as a possibility. Um, you also have the fact that people are always aware of the dangers of illness. You know, when people get a cold or, you know, even a minor ailment, everyone starts talking about it. And partly because in this society, you know, many, sometimes a minor ailment could develop into a serious one that would kill someone. And you couldn't really know about that in advance. And so this means that people often worry about it. Uh, and you get, and you get um, when this happens, you know, people will fret about it and want to make sure that someone is okay before they are willing to relax. You can certainly see this in Jane Austen's letters, which focus heavily on matters of illness, talking about someone who's ill, and then later letter will say, oh, it looks like so-and-so has recovered. This also is one of the things we see a number of characters who are kind of hypochondriacs in Jane Austen, constantly complaining about their ailments. Well, in a certain sense, you know, when we still have those today, but it may have been especially, probably especially likely to have people like that then because everyone was aware that even a small ailment could be ultimately fatal. At the same time, it also meant that those who were hypochondriacs might have been better able to get away with it, might have experienced more tolerance than nowadays because people were afraid to say to someone, oh, you're just, it's all in your head because there might be occasional cases where people who did just have a minor ailment did just die. Another thing, I mean, this is something I sort of thought of myself after reading this, is that you can even think about the fact this these novels show everyone very eager to make a marriage at an early age. Well, one thing that might have been an important factor, probably was one factor encouraging this, was everyone's awareness that they might not have that long to live. You know, that you knew that, you know, you might live to an old age, but you often, there's a good chance you also would die early. Therefore, it didn't make sense to hold off and wait. You know, you wanted to go ahead and you know, do what you could with your life uh, while you were still around. Another thing is you have issue of, another thing he points out that is there but is often taken for granted is servants. 
only occasional references to servants in the novel, so it's sometimes easy for those of us reading now to forget about them, but in fact, people at that time would have known that servants would have been everywhere, especially for people of the economic and social level of these characters. Um, and you know they would be constantly present. I mean, you really couldn't uh, live a comfortable life with, uh, without servants in those days, given the lack of many modern conveniences. And there are various effects of that. You, know, you have at various times characters worrying about servants overhearing. You know, people talking about how well, we shouldn't discuss things right now at the dinner table because that's when the servants are present. Maybe after dinner we'll discuss things because that's another thing you see in the novels. Servants are sources of gossip. They find out something, they tell other servants and other households, soon it's spread all over the place. Um, and that was something everyone would understand in this society. Also, you have an understanding that they become a barrier to any kind of illicit behavior, especially sexual behavior. If anyone had an affair, servants are gonna know and they'll tell everyone else. There's no way you're gonna keep something like that secret. And that itself is a factor that influences people's lives. Um, also, how many servants you do have and your relationship with them becomes a crucial indicator of status. Uh, in Sense and Sensibility, the mother of the heroines, Mrs. Dashwood, is forced to leave her existing home and go to a new home where she only has three servants. Well, anyone in this society would have known that is a real markdown because she had come from a very grand home that would have probably had a couple, might have easily had a couple dozen servants. And, and, that, and, and she has a hard time adjusting to that. She's constantly making unrealistic plans about the improvement she's going to make to her new home. That are plans that her income will not support, but that in many ways is you know, a sign that she is just not fully acclimated to her new position in life. And we have another character, um, Mrs. Smith of Persuasion, who has lost a lot of her money and now is, is kind of almost becoming kind of best friends with a servant, a woman named Nurse, Nurse Rook. Well, that again would be a sign for people at the time of how much she has come down in the world. The heroine, when she happens to visit this woman, an old friend of hers, doesn't even notice the nurse, which would be a more of a normal attitude. And one, I want to also add that if you think about how important life is without servants, this is also something that, um, would be a reason for worrying a lot about money when you're married. I mean, that's something as a basic reality of Jane Austen society. People are always worried about how much money people have. Well, I guess one analogy might, if you put it in our own terms, would be you know thinking about somebody nowadays. Let's say you fell in love with someone else, but then was told by that person, well, if you want to marry me, I want to reject the modern world and go live somewhere without electricity and running water and all sorts of modern conveniences. Would you still be willing to? marry me. I suspect a lot of people might, even if they were genuinely in love with that person, might decide, I don't want to do that. Well, within this society, marrying someone who didn't have much money, which means you couldn't then live a life with servants, would be somewhat the equivalent of having, uh, like say nowadays, of marrying and let's say going off in a cabin in the woods with, and living without the sort of conveniences we take for granted. So I mean, this is something that helps undergird this emphasis upon um, wealth. A final thing is that he also points to, that is, might say a more hidden element, would be the issue of sex and courtship. This is a society that, where sex is almost never discussed, and when it is, it's discussed euphemistically, and in which um, there are very strict codes against uh, any kind of sexual behavior, any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage. Um, but that doesn't mean that sex is not there. Every, you know, there are references at various points to people's physical attraction to another. Well, people would have understood at that time that this means that they are, you know, ha are, have a sexual desire for another person. It just wouldn't be stated so explicitly. So when Darcy comes to Elizabeth uh, and makes his proposal and says, in vain have I struggled, you know, but it will not do. I must tell you how much I love you, well, people would understand that he's talking at least partly about a very profound physical sexual attraction to her. And that's what he's struggling against and ultimately did not manage successfully to struggle against. And that's why he's proposing to her, even though, as he goes on to explain, he finds her, her social position uh, degrading. Um, and so you get this emphasis on, you know, the, because it's not, uh, 
expressed, we might tend to forget it, but it's definitely there. And at the same time, uh, the, also the absence of sexual activity or the strong restrictions on sexual activity outside of marriage is also a reason that you get a number of cases, for example, in her novels of men marrying wives who are fairly foolish and end up not being very um, good companions, but who are pretty, like, say, Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. But one reason is simply that for, let's say, a young man in the society who you know, became strongly attracted to a woman, the only way that he would be able to have sex with her basically would be to marry her. There would really be no other means and often very little means altogether of uh, getting sexual satisfaction unless he was willing to visit prostitutes, which pose a lot of risk and things like syphilis. Um, so, and they think that if that's an underlying reality. We may forget about it now, but it is very much part of this society and everyone would understand this. Also, these same taboos also mean that you have very strong restrictions relating to courtship, so, which again would be understood by contemporary readers. You never basically said to someone, I love you, unless you were intending to marry them. Uh, when Darcy says to Elizabeth, you must tell me in that same proposal scene how much I admire and love you, she understands immediately that this is a proposal of marriage. It's not that she's being vain or presumptuous. Anyone in this society would have understood this. And again, you know, this is, I think he does a good job of pointing out these things that we may forget because of our own lack of knowledge of the ways of this society, but that are still there. And she didn't feel the need to point them out because the people she was addressing, the readers of her own time, would have understood them also. So in any case, just to, just to sum up, I think the book does an excellent job then of both of analyzing a lot of different aspects of Jane Austen's novels and especially at pointing out many of these subtle points that you might otherwise overlook. So in any case, I will be happy to field any questions about this book or just about Jane Austen in general. Uh, yes. Anything in the novels that shows you that these men have had sex with the servants? Are there illegitimate children that are there or something? Because that's typical in upper classes that the men would put the moves on the servant girl. So I'm just wondering if there's anything in there that in these Jane Austen novels that says that they did. No, there's no reference to that. Now, I think it did happen, though there even there would be barriers. Um, yeah, because, I mean, first of all, you know, there would still be considered definitely, there would be a considered wrong, and you would, you know, especially if, you know, you got a man fooled around with a, a poor woman, a serp, whether a servant or just a local woman who worked somewhere else, uh, she got pregnant. There were very limited, little or no means of birth control then. You know, he would, it would be a problem for him. Um, he would be considered responsible for that. Uh, to take one example, not in Jane Austen, but in, a uh, novel by George Eliot, a uh, later 19th century writer, but one that was set around the time of Jane Austen, Adam Bede, that centers around a young man of upper class man who ends up uh, seducing a woman from a poor background and um, she ends up getting pregnant. The, the scandal that erupts eventually, while it doesn't lead to any legal punishment of him, for him, does force him kind of to leave the neighborhood because everyone has now, he's been so discredited. So there were certain barriers against that. People who wanted to do something, let's say upper class men, would be more likely to do something like when they went to London or to a city, perhaps to, you know, maybe get in, try to, you know, go to a, a brothel or perhaps try to get a mistress or something. Among the high aristocracy, that was more common. Who te They tended to live in in London and had more means to do that. But even in the, the kind of people that you have in Jane Austen, it would, be, it would be difficult for a man to do that. I mean, there were certainly cases, but it would still be hard because people would find out, I mean, this is one of the things, there's a comment in one of her novels that you're, every person lives surrounded by a neighborhood of voluntary spies and everyone's watching out for everyone else's business, servants are around. So people would find out about it and this could cause serious problems. I guess the one example, actually I should amend a little bit what I said initially, there is the character of Willoughby in Sense and Sensibility who has um, seduced a young woman, not someone who is a servant, but someone who is a kind of, uh, just a, another young woman. And that leads uh, to great problems for him. Uh, and, it, and it's seen by other characters as being the kind of 
the signal of his ultimately untrustworthy character. Um, yes? I find when reading the novels or seeing them portrayed in the film or television, there seems to be a repetition of a woman trying to better herself, get married, or as Jane Austen says, remain on the shelf. And it goes on and on and on. Different social situations, but pretty much the same. Uh, would you agree with that? Okay, yes. I don't know if everyone heard that, but saying that there is a kind of repetition within Jane Austen that is a theme of a woman trying to get married and, you know, or facing that as the alternative to sort of being on the shelf and that you see that in the novels repeatedly. Um, yes, I think that's true. I think um, partly, I think it's just that she does choose in each novel to make it primarily about love and marriage. And she has a kind of common formula in each novel that you bring together within the same place, a number of unmarried young men and young women uh, who are in various ways attracted to one another and then sort of see how their various sometimes rivalries and conflicts and ultimately pairings off. Um, and partly I think that's just her formula for writing a book. It gives her a way to, I think partly, it's she's trying to write books about ordinary life um, and but at the same time wants to have some drama to enliven the story, and since marriage is probably the most dramatic event that happens to most people, most ordinary people in this in the society she's looking at, that becomes a natural focus. In addition, she's also focusing especially on women, on female characters, and for women in this novel. That was, in a sense, your, what your life was focused on. Was I mean, essentially, that was in a, the only career open to a woman. Uh, if a woman did not get married, she was in a very difficult situation. She would spend the whole life sort of living on the charity of her family, and you know she would have a lower social status. She would often probably not have a lot of money. So being able to marry is absolutely critical to their fate. So it's natural that the female characters are going to be focused so heavily on trying to marry, and if they can, mostly trying to better themselves through marriage, though some characters are willing to marry someone who doesn't offer such strong social or economic advantage, who's not necessarily raising them up, but they still want to marry someone at the same time who offers them at least a decent living. Yeah? Do you think that of the novels, the motion pictures, TVs, reflect her own situation in life? That's hard to say. I mean, we, we have limited information about her personal life. I mean, we do know that she, you know, she indicates in some of her letters when she, she was a young woman that she was interested in men, um, but we don't know the exact nature of her own uh, love life. We, and the, the most significant piece of complicating information we have is that when she was 27, which was an age at which a woman was just starting to kind of go past the age of marital eligibility in the society. She did receive a proposal from a man who had a fairly good property, would have provided her a comfortable income and home, and she accepted him initially, but then the next morning changed her mind um, and uh, broke the engagement. And uh, we again, we don't know the exact reasons. There's some evidence that maybe the man was a little bit kind of you know, he was, doesn't seem to have been a bad man, but maybe a little bit awkward or uncouth in some respects. Um, but in any case, that's all we know. And then it, after that, she seems to have decided that she would probably be a spinster, a single woman, the rest of her life. It doesn't seem that, she, from what we can see from her letters, that she um, experienced great regret at that. But I think she probably would have, it meant that, for example, she was always in a more precarious financial position, at least until she started making money from her novels. And it did mean that, socially speaking, she was in a lesser position. But yes, I mean, there is a certain irony that she herself lived her life without getting married, but focuses so much on marriage. But I guess it may have been that she was aware that for most women, you know, this was their main focus of life. And of course, obviously, not everyone could, as she did, fill her life with writing novels. If you don't get married, you know, you didn't, there really wasn't a lot you would do with your life otherwise. You know, you, it's not like you could go out and get a job to occupy your time and interests. Um, yes? 
Well, I, one of the uh, novels, and I can't remember exactly what the title is, the young lady turned down the proposal of a British naval officer. That's Persuasion. That's Persuasion. Okay. okay. But the thing that I liked about the storyline from there on is her character development as a person inside to begin to see that, yes, there were things in this young naval officer that were good things. And eventually he came back after getting quite a few promotions and doing a few, this was sort of related to the Napoleonic Wars right. and so forth. And, but I thought that that development of the uh, <coughs> heroine's character in the novel, and as showed on some of the BBC programs, was very good because it exemplified that she was, how should I call it, she was sort of shallow, or she was shallow. She needed to develop certain aspects of her womanhood and her outlook as a human being to merit, to match where he was. I don't know if that comes from Well, I think that that's partly it. I mean, she, I think, became aware she had rejected him early on. Uh, when she was young, partly because she was persuaded by others to do so, she became aware that it was a mistake and she shouldn't have. And then when we see her in the novel open, she is a fairly mature woman who's very reflective. Um, and actually, though, though in, and I think wishes things had been differently, and but now in a sense eventually gets a second chance. We also see him when early on he is full of resentment at her earlier rejection, but gradually, as he comes to appreciate her character, he overcomes his resentment. That's right. yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, no, I, and I think that's actually a, a particularly good example of her ability to get inside people's head, because the main character, Anne Elliot, the heroine, is a very thoughtful and reflective person, not that outgoing, kind of quiet, but spends a lot of her time thinking about things, and I think she does a good job of relating her thoughts and the development of her thoughts and feelings. One of the aspects there that I thought was very interesting was the fact that she also learned what to accept in terms of other people's judgments in her family, in her close relationship, that were really valid judgments and what weren't. But she was taking in a lot of things from other people that were, really were not valid in terms of where she wanted to go with her life, you see. That's right. I mean, she does, she has to come to realize she actually, her father and her elder sister both have, are very flawed people, and she has to know how to separate her judgment from them, as well as from this close friend of hers, Lady Russell. Um, and yes, f become more independent in her thinking. This is something you actually see in a lot of the novels, a common theme of the heroines being in a situation where, in some respect or other, they have a parent or other relative that has some significant flaws and that in some respects may do things that sort of hurt or embarrass them and they have to kind of figure out how to negotiate that. They still love and respect these people. They don't want to openly argue with them, but at the same time they still want to maintain a certain independence of judgment. And so there's a delicate balance they've got to reach between trying to um, maintain family love and harmony and respect, but at the same time not allowing their own judgment and their own decisions to be distorted by bad advice or bad influences from others. Um, yes? Isn't there some uh, indication that um, Jane Austen's family situation, um, maybe the health of some of her family members, might have um, somewhat influenced her decision not to marry? I don't, I'm not sure about that. I mean, most, actually her family in general was a, was a healthy one. Uh, that uh, actually, uh, there were eight children. All of them survived to adulthood, which was unusual in those days. And I think she who died, she died at 41 and she was the youngest. Mo most of them lived well into like, into old age. Um, so I don't believe that I've, I have I don't know. I, I think probably, I mean, well, we don't know. I mean, actually, we don't know the reasons why. I mean, how much was it because she had decided not to? How much was it was lack of opportunity? I mean, one thing that certainly did influence it was that she was in a, not in the best financial position because, okay, her father was a clergyman, which meant like all, what are the things about members of the clergy who were members of the kind of, who were of the same general class, the gentry class that was, 
or genteel classes that were dominated society and that she focuses on, clergy often enjoyed a good present income, but it was only an income there, that was there as long as they were alive. Once they died, it expired, so they couldn't often leave a lot to their children. So she didn't have much in the way of, a, of inheritance and of a dowry coming from her father. And there is a story that, um, that has some basis. We don't know exactly what happened, but it does seem there was a man when she was very young named Tom Lafroy that she, um, at least the, the two of them were attracted to each other and probably broke it off because neither of them had enough money to support themselves. Um, if, and so I think that probably was a factor, I'm sure, that because people did have to worry about money and people did, it was an important factor. The fact that she didn't have a large fortune would mean that it would have been a lot of men who might even been attracted to her would still have decided that they couldn't, either they wouldn't have wanted to pursue her in the first place or even if they liked her, they wouldn't have wanted to propose because they felt it wouldn't have been prudent from a financial point of view. And of course, the one man that we know did propose was someone who did have his own property that was pretty ample, but it happened that she decided she just didn't love him uh, sufficiently to marry him. Uh, what about, um, have, have heard, using the money from her books to help support her family or the siblings that? Well, what happened was, I mean, she, I guess the basic story is that uh, she and her sister, her sister also didn't marry. They were the two girls in the family. They continued to live with their parents, which would be a standard thing for women who didn't marry. You didn't, women, single women didn't go set up with their own households. Um, at, and they continued to live at least reasonably well as long as their father was alive because he had his current income. But then at a certain point, she was, I think in her around, uh, mid-20s or so, he died. Um, her, then it was the household was just her mother and her sister and herself. They were in a much tougher situation. How they survived um, was the mother had a small inheritance of her own. The sister had a small annuity that she got from a man that she had been engaged to who then died. But the main source of income was the brothers. All their uh, brothers got together and agreed to donate a certain annual sum for the maintenance of their sister and their mother, and that was mostly how they did it. So they managed at least, they weren't well off, but they were at least comfortable, but of course they were doing it through other people's charity, which I'm sure had to be, you know, not, you know, you're always aware of that, and in Jane Austen's case, I'm sure she was also aware that she was the one of the three members of their small household. She was the one who wasn't contributing anything until later on when she does start making money from her books, and then she doesn't make an extraordinary amount of money, but she does make a decent amount, and she shows in her letters that she appreciated that amount. She liked being able to make it. I mean, she consistently shows she was not that interested in fame or in having her name bandied about or in meeting celebrity, literary celebrities or anything like that, but she is, and she is appreciate being able to earn some money, and I'm sure having been poor and living on other people's charity would make her appreciate that. But it wasn't the basis of her being able to live um, until fairly late in her life. Uh, yes? I read, I don't remember where, uh, some authors surmised that because she's had these brothers who married, had many children, saw her sisters-in-law die in childbirth, that maybe she decided, this is just a surmise, maybe she decided that she would rather write books than bear children and not have time to write. That could be, that could be, and especially, I mean, that's certainly a possibility. There are, we don't know that, you know, because it's in, in almost all of these things in relation to what she was really thinking and feeling are necessarily speculation, but, because we uh, don't have a lot of evidence, but there are some comments in letters where she talks about, you know, the difficulties of some women she knows in, you know, bearing a lot of children, and um, it is true, she did have a couple sisters-in-law who did die really young. And so I'm sure that, was, that awareness was certainly there. I mean, I think anyone, any woman in the society would have been aware of that, though most still married, partly because of the very strong social pressures. But in her case, you know, the fact that she did have this other outlet, which is writing books, would certainly have been an important factor. Wasn't that true with the Bronze sisters too? Uh, that uh, and uh, the Bronte George sisters, Eliot, George Eliot, and so forth. All of the uh, English uh, 
female uh, authors? Most of them. There are a few who were married, but a lot of them, more often than... In that period, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s? Yes, I think it is true that a disproportionate number of female authors are did remain unmarried, partly because... Um, Mart I mean, I think one obvious reason would be that if you did get married, the duties of being a wife and a mother were very heavy, and therefore it would probably be a lot harder to work on books. Um, of course, in each individual case, there may be other specific reasons, but I think there is, that is certainly one factor. Um, and there are a few. There's a woman named Elizabeth Gaskell, who's another writer who has a lot of similarities to Jane Austen, and she did marry and had children and also still wrote novels. But it, it was a bigger challenge to do that than to do it while remaining single. Mm -hmm.